Up to seven in 10 women around the world experience physical and or sexual violence during their lifetime. Between 250,000 and 500,000 women were raped during the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. 60,000 women were raped during conflicts in the former Yugoslavia that occurred between 1992 and 1995. At least 200,000 women have been raped in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the DRC, since 1998. That relates to an average of 1,100 rapes reported per month and an average of 36 women and girls raped each day. Male-directed sexual violence in conflict has taken place in at least 25 countries in the past decades. A recent survey of the Eastern DRC indicates that 15% of male respondents were victims of sexual violence in the context of the ongoing conflict. Rape has been a war crime since the 1970s. But the changes since the 1970s are absolutely stupendous in public attitudes to rape and indeed to official attitudes to it. If we think back to the 1970s, yes, rape was recognised in the Geneva Convention as a war crime, but actually people either denied that it happened or they said that it did happen, but that it was natural and there was nothing that could be done about it. Or there was a kind of understanding that it happened, but it wasn't anything that anybody ought to mention because it was shameful, because people didn't like talking about sex. Now we've got UN conventions, we've got speeches, we've got the Secretary General saying that violence against women is, you know, a number one priority for international policy and that governments have a duty to do something about it. The world has changed so dramatically in that respect. I think that's really true and it's important to recognise that the steps forward marked particularly by the UN resolutions on the subject, 1325, the landmark resolution on women, peace and security, and 1820 yeah. on the protection of civilians from sexual violence in conflict, are massive institutional and official recognitions that rape is not an inevitable or a natural part of conflict. And I think it's important to note too that part of the historical context driving that agenda is the uh, conflict scene in Rwanda and in the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s mm. where the unfortunate yet traditional logic of rape as a weapon of war where committing acts of sexual violence against women is seen as an attack actually on the men that they are in a relationship with their father their brother through understanding very gendered understandings of honor uh, directly addressing all of that through UN resolutions, through conventions, through raising sexual violence against women and sexual violence against men, indeed, to the high politics of the international security agenda is phenomenal. At the same time, however, it's important to note that all of those legal measures and institutionalizations remain bound up in a very gendered binary mm. relating to the appropriate or conventionally understood roles of men and women in conflict. Men are traditionally understood as warriors, as soldiers, as active combatants, as perpetrators and potential victims of violence, whereas women are understood primarily as very passive agents that are inherent victims in the context of conflict, and that none of those UN measures, unfortunately, are able to address that underlining uh, ideological construction. Fine, okay, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. And I mean, my subject is the history of political thought and political theory and everything you've said about the way in which addressing the injustices of sex and gender often operate so as to just kind of reinforce the very sex and gender that you want to dismantle in the first mm. place. I absolutely take that. In the history of political thinking from the ancient Greeks to the present day, we have this constant theme that politics is a male business. Men have to be free. Men have to go out into the public world to engage in government and international relations. And women, by contrast, are confined to the domestic sphere. Because women aren't able 
so the ideology goes, women aren't able to do military service. And that's always been an excuse, actually, a reason for not seeing women as citizens. Now, obviously, that is another thing that's changed. Women have achieved citizenship. And interestingly, both, the, you know, the fact of women's participation in military service and indeed the extent of their participation in combat is on the agenda. It's not settled in most countries, but there is now a move to saying that we can't any longer have that idea that women are domestic and men are public or that men are warriors and women are the people who have to be defended against them. But on the other hand, I agree that identifying sexually specific crimes sort of reinforces the gender distinction or the sexual distinction that all of that policy has been trying to get away from. I do think you're right about that. I think I'm glad you agree because I think there is an important tension in recognizing women as agents who are potentially engaged in conflict as members of a military, as members of a militia, mm. as various forms of formal or informal support personnel, and how that might change their vulnerability to different forms of violence, um, as well as their experience of it, should it happen to occur. It's also important to note that this very gendered binary which has been reproduced in some of these resolutions and legal instruments, also disadvantages in many ways male victims of sexual violence in the context of conflict. Because when we understand rape as a form of violence that happens only to women and is an honor or a shame related mm. crime and experience, it makes it very difficult for men to speak out about being victimized in this particular way. And so this very gendered understanding of sexual violence and rape in the context of war has strong implications for the ability of both men and women to speak out and to understand their own experiences of conflict and violence in a way that resonates and is publicly intelligible. So Kate, are you really saying after all that, that the recent public arguments about how to eradicate rape in war aren't the feminist victory that people like me, I think, really <laughs> did think that they were. No, I think it's completely fair and crucially important to understand uh, measures like the inclusion of rape, forced prostitution and forced pregnancy, sexual slavery in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court or um, the important verdicts from the International Criminal Tribunal on Rwanda affirming rape as a war crime. It is of crucial importance that we understand that that to be a monumental step forward for feminism and for gender equality and for men and women alike. That's key. But it doesn't address the fundamental underlying ideological structures that support men as active agents of violence and women as passive victims because it still relies on that distinction between male soldier, female civilian. So is a conclusion from what you've just said mm -hmm. that the, where we've got to now, where la rape is labelled as an international crime and it's understood as being a crime against humanity in many, in many settings, um, that that really hasn't taken us far enough because the kind of underlying ideas of sex and gender that are behind that label are designed not to allow us to eradicate rape and surely it's e eradication that should be our goal. Is that what you're saying? Yes, the eradication of rape is the key, is the key goal right. of this particular set of UN policies. But in that context, I think it's also important as feminists to think about the context in which that rape occurs, which is conflict. And there is perhaps a larger question that should be considered as to whether it's conflict we should be eradicating and whether there is such a thing as legitimate violence in a, in a war or a conflict. And that's a very tr tricky question to grapple with. Okay, so what you're saying is 
The danger with identifying rape as a particular problem is that it sort of fixates on sexuality and honour and the sort of gender uh, regime that we want to get away from. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it occurs to me that focusing just on conflict isn't going to get you very far because, you know, that's, it's, it's vague then it's encompassing too much. So isn't the issue that as, polit as political actors and as policy makers and also as social scientists and social thinkers, we have in the case of every kind of violence, which we know does immeasurable harm, both in conflict and in civilian situations. For every kind of violence, you really do have to understand what it means culturally, what it means to the person who's perpetrating it, and what it means to the person who is a victim of it. And it's only when we really understand what violence means, and also what it means to other audiences it's only when you get a grip on violence at that level that we're going to have any chance of moving towards eradication and eradication is always going to have to go by way of changing the meaning of it right making mm -hmm. things that are acceptable unacceptable making behaviors that seem to uphold the proper social order rather seem to break down social order. So you've got to change the meaning of the thing before we're going to be able to move any way towards eradication. And that goes for all forms of violence in war. It goes for sexual violence to men in war, and it goes for sexual violence to, re to, to women in war and in society in general. Is that the point, I think? Okay, so if I understand what you're saying correctly. What you're suggesting is that while these legal measures and understanding rape as a war crime are important, if we really want to address sort of the underlying causes and circumstances that lead to sexual violence, we need to be working for a more profound political rather than legal transformation and change that addresses what might be understood as sort of the gender order and what it means to be a good man, what it means to be a good woman, and how we act or perform or be gender mm -hmm. at a much more profound underlying level. Okay, so we began by thinking that what's happened over the last 30 years has to count as a feminist victory. But on the other hand, what this conversation has shown us is that feminism can't give any easy answers to what are really, really difficult social and political questions. So what we're saying now is that it looks as though certainly UN conventions are really important weapons in campaigns to change the relationships between men and women. And they're also really important weapons in campaigns to try to address the terrible consequences of what are known as crimes against humanity, but also just ordinary, ordinary violent conflict in, in wars. So feminism is asking that those UN actions have to be matched by a much more complicated way of thinking about what relationships between men and women would have to be like if we were going to eradicate some of the terrible atrocities that are going on in the world in the 21st century.